Holding my chest. My legs and hands. Silence. Feeling the pressure. What? She was a fool. It's a million bloody degrees out there. Oh, wind. I'm sorry if I said anything awful. Blessed lambs, of course. Why hadn't he got up to chop the capsicum? I was never a good reader. Ah, Immaculately bland. Anyway, it looks like... What do we do with this now? You're not even supposed to use the word fat. Boys like girls. When we were very young... I was back home in Norwich. Square Sound. You're listening to the audiobook podcast for the makers and listeners of audiobooks. Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of the Audiobook Podcast. I'm Abby Holmes and together with Justine Sloan-Lees, we discuss what goes on behind the stories in the production of audiobooks. In today's episode, we're joined by David Tredinick, an Australian actor with a long career in theatre, taking a Green Room Award for the lead in Angels in America, but best known for his regular role as Simon Trader in the television series The Secret Life of Us. Amongst his acting credits, David is an awarded narrator of audiobooks, having narrated more than 150 titles. He received both Vision Australia Adult Narrator of the Year Award and a Sanderson Young Adult Narrator of the Year Award for his work in audiobooks. So, let's get started. Thanks, Abby. So, David and I have known each other quite some time. Yonks and yonks. We go way back to the early days of, well, not the early days of ABC, but... Yes. Back in the day where the, uh, the studios had, like, foley... Sure did. ...stuff, like doors and, like, sand pits and gravel pits and stuff. All that stuff. We Excellent. had a special window box, so it was like a, a square box that the foley operator could get in and it had different windows on each side and it had curtains on one side and Venetian blinds on another side. So if you're doing a thing about someone spying through the Venetians, you can run your finger up and down them. Oh, I loved all that when I walked in for the first time. I thought, oh, this is my dream. I want to live here. <laughs> <laughs> now, David, you, like me, did an arts degree back in the mid-80s when, during the halcyon days, when one could do such a thing without incurring a massive hex debt the size of a small family sedan. <laughs> <laughs> so you're at Melbourne Uni. What did you do at Melbourne Uni? Yeah, I majored in history and minor in anthropology wow. back then. Yeah. Oh. And while you were there, you got involved in student theatre and independent theatre? I was doing student theatre, yes, which led to working for other independent fringe companies around Melbourne. So I did that for many, many years, getting, you know, working for nothing, doing little (laughs) odd jobs during the day and then rehearsing and performing at night, you know, doing show after show after show for, for diddly squat financial gain and loved every minute of it. So I have a feeling that probably the first time you came into ABC radio drama was with um, an adaptation of one of Sam Sajafka's plays, because you'd done a number of them, La Mama. That's right. That was The Hive and um, ABC, I don't don't know whether they approached Sam or somebody else did the adaptation, but yeah, we'd done The Hive at La Mama in 1990 or 91, and then, yeah, that was the first radio play that I did, and they had an amazing cast. I think it was Geoffrey Rush and Helen Morse might have been in it and it was just ridiculous and that was my entree into into the world of radio and yeah I was hooked and that was just shortly before my entree a year or so later into the world of radio drama and by that time you were one of our regular voices we had you on speed dial to read all kinds of things so radio plays and also features and documentaries and then a few years later we got you to read your first book book, which I think was The Merry-Go-Round in the Sea by Randolph Stowe. It was. That was 94. I was doing a show called Angels in America and we were over in Adelaide and one of the ABC producers who was based in Adelaide got me to come in during the day to do that one. Which So that was an abridged version of the Merry-Go-Round in the Sea. I so know how abridged it was because I had to do the post-production <laughs> <laughs> and I had to cut it down to a certain certain duration that was not, you know, not a minute over, not a second over. Oh, and dear. Yeah. Yeah, I've, yeah, that was a really early crash lesson in hard editing for content. But um, so then did you move on to Vision Australia, as many people do? A couple of years later, yes. So I kept doing stuff for ABC and then a letter had gone out from uh, what was Louis Braille Audio or the Louis Braille Library back yes. then to all the agents going, we, we need more narrators if anybody's interested in coming in and auditioning put your hand up, please, and I thought, great, because I've always loved 
spoken word, you know, from the 70s, you know, listening to the radio, you know, that was, I think, you know, the 70s was like the, the last days of the radio serial. So that mm. was stuff I'd, you know, I'd go to sleep listening to at night and it just, I just love that world. So the opportunity to do talking books was, uh, you know, I just grabbed it. So, yep, they accepted me and then I started doing books for them. Uh, back then they were doing both uh, library titles, non-commercial titles and commercial books. So you had a different rate for each, but there was like just heaps of work. Heaps so of work, yeah. I was going in, I was working every week in talking books. So that was kind of my training ground, I suppose, because you just read everything, you know, American titles, you read, you know, with an American accent all the way through, you had, you know, fiction, non-fiction, kids' books, crime, whatever came up, you were doing it. Of varying quality from the narrator's <laughs> <laughs> point of view sometimes, depending on whether you were right for the book or not. But um, that was a really good starting ground. And then a few years later, somebody mentioned Belinda, and then I started working for Belinda as well, by which stage um, Vision Australia had stopped doing commercial titles. So it was a nice little transition yeah. over to Belinda at that point. Any idea how many you've done? I reckon I've got no exact figures, but it's somewhere between 100 and 200. I think 200 would be peaking, but it's probably getting close to between all the different companies that I've worked for. And you mentioned, you know, listening to spoken word radio and stuff, but you've also always been engaged with writing and you do write yourself, yeah? Yeah, yeah. screenplays and academic writing, working with words. And then talking books, it's an interpretive act. So, yeah, I love sort of getting the book and going, OK, it's this book, so I need to take this kind of approach with it. Or, you know, when you first approach a book and go, OK, I think this is going to be a real struggle <laughs> to turn this into something that's going to work for audio because the author hasn't written with a sense of a, a yeah, voice. Any, uh, yeah, any yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, fine on the page and you often don't pick it up initially. Yeah, I read an article in The Guardian and they had done a survey at the Edinburgh Writers Festival about whether or not authors heard their characters speaking in their head. And Val mm -hmm. McDermott, for example, was someone who said, oh yeah, I hear every voice in my head as, as I'm writing the dialogue. I hear them saying it and I know whether it's right or wrong and I uh. change accordingly. So yeah, I think some authors do. And, and then yep. as a narrator, I'm sure you'll then find that those words just leap to life off the page oh, and it's so no much, effort. So much easier to do. Uh, I've just finished doing one book as a library title for Vision Australia by an author, Bruce Venables, who had never read before, and it's one he published in 2017, and it's a romp. Characters from all around the world descend on Ballarat during the gold rush and all sorts of things eventuate. But Bruce Venables is an actor as well. Yeah. So he just understands mm -hmm. character and dialogues, and each character, if they come from Liverpool, they speak with a Liverpool accent. If they come from America, it's with an American so patois, it's on the whether page. it's Boston or whether yeah. they're deep south or whatever. And it, it's just, it's been so easy to do. It's taken me half the time it's taken other books to do because yeah. it just flows. That's that's interesting. Yeah, when it is presented on the page, phonetically as per the Scouse accent or the American accent yeah. um, is helpful. Is there anything you wouldn't do? I mean, I know work is work, but at this point, having been doing it for so long, are there things you just think, yeah, no, I'm not doing that? Look, if it was really offensive, like racially offensive or offensive to women or whatever, then, yeah, I would draw the line. If I'm reading through the book and go, oh, wow, you know, this is white supremacist <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> um, but I'll make certain adjustments depending on what the intent of the author might be or whether it's a period book. I did a book recently for Belinda, which was a very well-known author, but was writing in the 50s. Mm. And his attitude towards Indigenous Australians was very different. But yeah. that was the book. So in that case, you go, well, this is a historical document. And mm. the book went out with a warning on the cover saying that attitudes... Reflects the attitude book, of the time, yeah, but yes, not current yeah, yet. Not, so I, I think that's perfectly mm. valid. 
One of the things you do with your work at Vision Australia is you record some incredibly dry material that has to be provided in an accessible form for vision impaired people. So do you mm-hmm. tell us about that part of your work? A lot of the corporate work that I will do, um, the more interesting stuff is like the local newspapers. You might do Melbourne News or, you know, Sandwich Times or whatever, and that's kind of interesting. But that will include things like the classifieds and, you know, what's <laughs> on. <laughs> it's just <laughs> awful. But then the really dry stuff might be an annual report, particularly one I do every year is one of the larger insurance companies. And that's all tables and figures. So you might spend two hours going through various tables, which are just numbers. And then you're having to go back to the X, Y axes to make sure you've got the right titles to each section. But I kind of like that. It appeals to the the, the OCD in me. <laughs> where I, can just, I just lock into the zone and I might be doing shopping lists in my head while I'm reading it, but I can get through that with minimal mistakes and actually find it quite an interesting exercise. It becomes kind of zen in a way, right. those things. I don't mind the dry stuff at all. Okay. In fact, the pressure's taken off you having to kind of interpret it in some way. You're just a voice delivering Mm. information. You're not having to add anything to it. So it's easier than doing a a normal fiction read in some way. (laughs) So do you have any preparation hacks? 101, read the book before you go into the studio. But not necessarily always done. Not always the case. And a lot of the stuff I'll do at Vision, there's no preparation before going and do corporate stuff. You're reading it dry from word go. So that's a skill as well to be able to just read off the page. Mm -hmm. But with a book, yeah, read the book, you know, note down every word, even if you think you know the pronunciation Mm -hmm. of a word because you've heard it in your head a thousand times. It's it's still, after 25 years, I'll still, you know, go to the pronunciation and go, wow. I have always thought that word was pronounced this way. And as a director, I do the same because, like you, I'm also a bookworm, so Mm -hmm. it's all book learning uh, of words, and I might have lodged something in my brain early on, and once it's in there, it's really hard to dislodge. So there's words that I'll go back and check every time, and there's also been words that I've been convinced I was right. I picked up Jen Valetic on a word a couple of years ago, and she said, no, Justin, I think you'll find that's incorrect. And I was like, no, Jen, I'm sure it's right. She was right. I just always done it wrong. Right, yeah, I've got like bona fides every time mm. I have to look it up. Into knee sign is <laughs> one. <laughs> I always have to go, yeah, no, nah, I think, no, nah, I'm double checking that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Words you've said a thousand times, mm. but they just don't go in. Mm. Accents you need to approach really carefully, yeah. I think, and each book is different and That can be determined by the style of the book, when the book is written, all that kind of thing, how far you go with an accent, whether you pull back with an accent. You've got to make all those decisions Mm -hmm. before you go into the studio. Otherwise, you're going to get halfway through a book and realise that you're going to have your tongue tied for the next three days because you've made a really bad choice with a character's (laughs) accent. It's got to be something that you can sustain. Created a rod for your own back. Yeah. Yeah. So I struggle with South African accents and Kiwi accents because they're the hard ones because they're the closest to ours. Accent, mm. so it's very hard to hear the difference. So you've got to go with something that's a, one, not a stereotype, and two, something that you can sustain. You make concessions along the way. Doing a little bit of practice with those before you go into the studio is always good, so you're not wasting the producer's time once you're in there. <laughs> time is money. Time is money in this industry. We've said it before and it's worth repeating because it's all pretty quick turnaround and, yeah, low margins. That's right. You know, whereas it would be lovely to take a book, a book that you really love and go into the studio and, like, pour over every word and every sentence and go back and do it again three times. You you can't. And that's how you and I used to do poetry when we recorded poetry for the ABC. I was thinking about that just yesterday. seven takes, yeah. yeah. How lovely was that? Yeah, and you just kind of tweak each take you know, do a slightly different interpretation, a slightly different emphasis, and then you could sit back and listen to them all and choose which ones worked or edit together one. Yeah, yeah. And we had all the time in the world. And then that lovely work you can do in post-production, you know, I've done a little bit of freelance producing, but you know it, you know, so much better. And at the end of the day, you know, you've got that audio, but then, you know, you're going to enhance it with music and sound Mm. and play around with it you know, in post, whereas a talking book, generally, it's just going bang, it's out yeah. there once once it's in the can, apart from a little bit of mastering, that's kind of it, a little mm-hmm. bit of music at the header in the end. 
What do you think's the favourite you've ever done? Have you got something you can name or a handful? Um, one of my go-to always is a book called The Mascot, which I did, in, I think, about 2004. And it was a book written by a guy called Mark Curzum, and it was written about his dad, Alex. And Alex was, uh, he became quite well known in Latvia and then in the Latvian community in Melbourne because he was a young mascot for a Latvian, well, they were an SS troop in Latvia during World War II. And he had a sort of a certain sort of notoriety for this because he was this little kid who'd been found in the forest and he'd travelled around with this troop all through World War II, seen horrific things over that time. In his later life, I think he must have been sort of approaching 70, he approached his son and said, look, I've got this story. Actually, you know, I was Jewish. My whole family were murdered by an SS troop. Right. And this is my background. And I saw my family murdered. And then he tries to, the father tries to reclaim his identity as a a Jewish person in Melbourne and like the Latvian community turned against him. The Jewish community don't accept him because of what he's been involved in during World War II. And it was just so affecting as a book because there were certain things in the book I had to check. I said, look, I really need to talk to the author. The author was very ill at the time, but his dad lived a few streets away <laughs> from me. So I got to meet yeah. Alex, this amazing man in his early 70s, who was like a television repairman in Altona North. And we spent a really lovely time sort of just sitting around talking about the story. And then afterwards, you know, he'd call me up and, you know, we developed a a friendship from doing this amazing tale. And it's those stories where you end up having that personal connection on some level, whether it's because you've had to contact the author and you sort of build a friendship there or it somehow impacted you in some way. And particularly with your background in history, being able to take that story and share it with other people must be a sense of ownership as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's normally kind of the memoirs, I think. They're the ones that affect me. Like the one I I didn't think was going to be special for me was Bob Irwin's memoir, Steve Irwin's Dad. Beautiful book. Really moving. The producer and I, we were just in tears through the last few chapters. We were constantly having to stop because it was just so amazingly impactful. That's a really fond memory. Neil Danaher's recent story about uh, motor neurone disease. Again, I know some of his family, so again, I had a connection to Neil's story, and that was a real pleasure to do. That's great. I want to talk to you about period voices because... Mm -hmm. We've had conversations before about finding voices, how to find character voices. And, you know, everyone knows that voices are placed in place. So you have an accent determined by where you come from and certain degree social class as well. But there's also a sense of accents being placed in time and accents change over time and voices sort of change a bit over time. And one of the things we used to have you on speed dial for at the ABC was your understanding of what, for example, a mid or early 20th century Australian voice might sound like, because it doesn't sound like most people you listen to now. So just mm-hmm. that maybe slightly more anglophone tone, you know, maybe somewhat better diction, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Something like like an early 20th century Australian accent is easy to work on because we do have recordings of people speaking from that time. You've got to take into account that they're recorded on certain medium, which affects the way that that accent is coming across. So we tend to think that you know most Australians talk with a terribly nasal voice because that's just how they came across on the phonograph um, when they're being recorded. Probably weren't all sort of up in their nose. <laughs> British accents, you, know, you can access anything from the 19th century because Dickens was such a fantastic chronicler of different 19th century accents. But, you know, a 16th century British accent, mm. where do you start? It's really tricky. You know, no one's come to any kind of definitive decision about, you know, what was the accent that Shakespeare was spoken in. Some people think that it's probably the closest thing is the Australian accent. I have heard that, Yes. And it does work. Shakespeare works really well in an Australian accent. But it's open for interpretation. So to a certain extent, you've got to bring your imagination to some books in that respect. Other challenges around accents as well that I think is worth noting too, and it came up in this book that I've just finished as well, when you've got characters who where English is a second language, but the book has them speaking in their own language, to certain people, and then they'll swap into Mm. speaking in an accented 
English. Mm. So I think, what do, what do you decide for that voice yes. when they're speaking in their own language? Yeah. It's always one that you, you have to make a decision about and it's a, it can be right or wrong depending on the book. Yeah, it's something you have to be really careful with and how does that fit in with the accent that you're using when they're speaking accented English too. Caroline Lee mentioned that to me recently. She had a book where that was a, a real issue and mm-hmm. um, she had to give it a lot of thought. So Right. Yeah, it's challenging. And then you get some books where there's people from a range of different places, but the author isn't terribly good with <laughs> with dialogue, so they've written them all in the same style. Mm. So then what do you do? How do you apply a Lancashire lilt over something that's been written in a very kind of dry sort of, uh, you know, uh, general sort of English modulated tone? It's, it ends up sounding really bad. Is there any accent you hate doing? Look, I just finished doing the book before this one was set in South Africa, so I'm feeling more confident about the South African accent now <laughs> since I've murdered it in so many different ways in that book. Um, no, there's things I prefer to do, like, you know, regional English accents generally. Funnily enough, my ability to do American accents has dropped off, whereas I spent a lot of my 90s doing... We should say the 90s, not your personal 90s, because you're not quite that old yet. Not my 90s, I'm not there yet, Justine. Um, uh, Yeah, a lot of the theatre I was doing was all American. Uh, Yeah, yeah. you know, Boston accents and Southern accents and, you know, so I was all across it. Now I come across an American accent in a book and I'm always horrified with what I come up with. So I hate it when there's suddenly an American character because I think I should be able to do this. Why am I struggling? I love, like, accented English. Mm. I think I really enjoy doing that. Yeah, Yeah, getting that right and making it not, you know, stereotypical but giving it that flavour that's really Mm. pleasurable and it's such an easy easy way to distinguish between characters too, mm. rather than just going, oh, that's my high voice, that's my low voice, I've got my John Flowers voice, which I'll use for old characters. <laughs> <laughs> if we should say, for people who don't know who John Flowers is, well, again, you and me being roughly contemporaries grew up in the early 80s listening to John Flowers on 3 R every Saturday afternoon with film bus forecast. Yes, really. It is a voice that's been well and truly um, modulated by decades of cigarette smoke. It's yes. very distinctive and always reassuring to people like us. G'day, my name's John Flowers. Well, that's a funny thing, being an old bloke these days, but I don't do any spring anymore. I just sort of shuffle along. In fact, my partner of 30 plus years refers to me as the Shambling Hulk. Oh, so delightful and yeah. such a great example of like an older Australian educated... Educated uh, is, yeah, that's good, yeah. But accented, not... Yeah. Um, wasn't at all impacted by the sort of need to speak with a, with a British accent during the 60s and 70s as a performer or presenter. David, on your way out, mm. clock our lift. The name of our lift is the John Flouse lift. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> hey, self-recording, I know that with the COVID situation, you have set yourself up a bit of a home set up and mm. you are recording some stuff at home. So how's that going? Um, that's good. It's getting better and better. I've had a few different versions over the last couple of months and it's something I've always wanted to do. So it's been a real plus of lockdown period and being out of work suddenly. So version one was in a walk-in robe and I got up sheets of colour board and stuck sound baffling on them and just built myself a little box with a little door and tied it all together with elastic bands um, so I could transport it in and out so I could get to our undies um, (laughs) when we needed to. But I had to get out of the wardrobe eventually. So I've moved that upstairs and now I'm dealing with sound from outside. It's amazing how many planes there are that go over Altona, which I was never aware of. Oh. It's about every 10 minutes. Well, I'm in Yarraville. I hear them too, but I'm not trying to record at home. Yeah, it's no good. So I'm getting a lovely dead sound, but I am getting a lot of bleed in and with, you know, kids at home too, it's getting a little bit noisy. But a builder friend of mine's building me something that's a little bit more soundproof with some lovely stuff called Sandwich Panel for anyone who's interested. But, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I'm finding I'm making more mistakes because I tend to be able to keep talking until the producer falls asleep generally, but I'm stopping a lot more often because I'm aware, having to be aware of so many more things when you're 
self-recording, just, you know, being aware of levels. The playing and, the dog, the yeah, levels. Yeah, yep. Working with the software, that kind of thing. So a little bit more distracted, but getting better at that now too. So are there things that you'd think you probably would prefer not to self-record and to have just the reassurance it sounds like it's all about me making me no, sad. No, 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 no. No, it's a good, a really good question. The biggest thing is not having a producer, not having someone to read to. Okay. I came into the studio a couple of weeks ago to do a corporate read for Vision Australia and oh, it was so nice to have someone on the other side of the glass. But having a little friend there rather than talking to yourself made a really big difference. And that's always been a huge part of it, even if the producer hates the book. If they're engaged on some level, even if it's just pure hatred <laughs> or, or a shared dislike of a particular title. That can be. I've been in that experience where it's particularly bonding, the shared dislike and disdain, so that it's just like, okay, we've just got to pull up our socks and get on with it. Yeah. We're in it together. The danger is that if you both hate the book or you're horrified by certain sections, I'm the opportunity to get the giggles oh, yeah. and to drive each other into fits of giggles can be really annoying. (laughs) Fun, but annoying. Hey, fan mail. Do you ever get fan mail? No. Why not? I don't know. No one likes me. I know that Stig must have, like, Santa's sack worth of fan mail every week because of the titles that he does, and they're just so loved by kids. Yeah. Loathed by their parents after the 28th repeat, but um, (laughs) loved by the kids. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've had some really nice feedback from authors over the years, and that's been nice when you get that. I can't imagine why an author would want to listen to their own book as a talking book, but bless them. (laughs) Sometimes they've contacted me and thanked me for... And they've discovered new things about the book by listening to it or with my interpretation. You yeah. go, oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah, actually, that does happen. And in my time at the ABC, recording plays and recording poetry, there were times when that really happened. So I'll never forget doing a play by Jane Bodie, mm. fabulous playwright, and Belinda McClory did the reading. Fabulous actress. She's my favourite actress. Yeah, we love Belinda. And Jane was up the back of the control room going, she's making it beautiful. Oh. <laughs> And so she really appreciated the performance that Belinda gave that just lifted it to another level. Oh, that's great. There's an author that I've worked with a lot, probably done about half a dozen of his books, and he he mentioned a couple of books ago that he's now writing with my voice in his head. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, massive non-fiction books, but he's kind of, he's developed oh, this rhythm because I fall into a rhythm, particularly with non-fiction, and I'm finding his books easier and easier to do because he knows <laughs> how I'm going to do them. Right. Yeah, because that's interesting that it's non-fiction because I read an article last week in The Guardian. I sound like I spend my whole time reading The Guardian online and I kind of do sometimes, but it was about authors and whether they do start writing for the narrator. So Ben uh-huh. Aronovich, who wrote the Rivers of London fantasy series, he said yes. When he wrote the first two books, they weren't yet audio books, but because mm-hmm. there's been several books and the same actor is now narrated each of them and he he said I now hear that person's voice when I'm writing the character It's a good thing if you're happy with the narrator's voice, if it drove you mad and you were kind of stuck stuck in a rhythm that you knew was just horrendous, you'd be cursing them for the rest of your your career And I do know of some actors who've become the voice of a certain author and they don't actually like the author very much and they're like, oh no please can't you find a new voice of you I don't want to be it anymore (laughs) (laughs) There's some books that I'll do where, you know, I'm not particularly fond of the books, but I just love the author, so I'll do them anyway just because I think, oh, bless. One question for you. Oh, okay. Kind of going back to accents, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Given the times and Black Lives Matter and everything, do you reckon there's such a thing as black voice and brown voice? I definitely think there's an Aboriginal accent, an Aboriginal voice, and Marianne, our producer, and I had a conversation last year with Leith McPherson about this, and mm-hmm. she said absolutely. Mm. What sort of decisions do you make, particularly it's if really you've got hard. a book that's been written by a white author mm. and there's a, an Indigenous character and it's mm. written a particular way, exactly. white narrator, yep. might just be like a minor character in there. Oh, what do you do? That is the ongoing question. Mm. We have done quite a lot of books by Indigenous authors here and we've built up a sort of group of readers who are Indigenous themselves. Mm. So that's great because, you know, we can get Tamala Shelton to read Tara June Winch and, you know, 
Mark Colesmith to read Warren Mundine for us. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. But when it, they're a character rather than the person, yeah, yeah, it's a whole other thing. And sometimes it's about the appropriateness of the portrayal. You yes. know, in, in the book itself, before you even take it to trying to do the audio book of it. So it is an ongoing question for us and, you know, one that we're constantly thinking about and trying to work out the best approach. Right. I ask that because I don't know the answer yeah. either. No, it's I'm not finding simple. myself halfway through doing an interpretation and go, oh, I don't know whether this is okay or not. Um, I think it's, you kind of let off the hook if it's like a first person narration and you let off the hook with a lot of accents if it's a first person narration True. because yeah. you go, oh, well, it's this person wasn't terribly good at this particular accent or they had a particular attitude towards a person from this particular country. Mm. That's why I can't get my mouth around this accent. Um, but when it's, you know, a, a third person narration. We always take some reassurance if there's been an Aboriginal person involved with the book yep. as a language language consultant. And mm-hmm. so we recently did a book by a British-born American writer that was set in Tasmania in 1840, so convict time, and had some content around Aboriginal people. But the author had worked with a prominent Tasmanian Aboriginal language consultant. And so we took some comfort for that and we put that in the credits. We made sure it was up front so people knew that that had been done and that yep. the author and therefore us weren't just taking random pot shots and guesses, that it, it had been thoroughly researched with an appropriate authority. Oh, fantastic. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So... It's been great talking to you. Have you got any other little tidbits or anecdotes you'd like to share with us? Oh, can I I ask you another question? This is like Stacey last week. He turned the tables on me and kept asking me questions. Yeah, I was thinking about today. I think, oh, but I I want to ask this question because you guys are working with a whole bunch of different narrators and you've got a whole different take on it than me. As a narrator, you're in a bubble a lot of the time. Back in the old days when you worked at Vision Australia, you'd sit with narrators during your tea break and share war stories. Now we're kind of falling our own. <laughs> I've been wondering often over the last few years about where talking audiobooks can go or where they will, where they are going, what the potential is for audiobooks. Because you know, your standard audiobook, you've got the, it's the written book and then we, somebody mm. speaks it. Are there other alternative approaches not necessarily for all audiobooks, but is there an audience, an appetite, an ability, is it cost-effective to be looking at audiobooks as a product? Well, I guess the most obvious thing is whether you do cast books, mm. so you're adapting it, it's often yep. an adaptation, um, because when you've got a multicast, you don't need the he says and the she says because yeah, yeah. you can hear it. Very cost expensive. effective, expensive, yeah, yeah, and that's one of the reasons the ABC stopped doing it. You know, much to your and my mm-hmm. great sorrow, because it it is expensive and more time consuming as well. Mm-hmm. The other thing people often mention to me is if you could use sound effects or music. Yeah. Again, I'd love to do that. That's the kind of thing I did at the ABC. Mm. I spent, you know, and you've produced stuff for us at the ABC. You know that joy of sitting oh, in the studio, so nice. playing with sound effects and music, and thinking, mm, yeah, no, not there, but maybe there, yeah. yeah. And maybe if we added some thunder as well, that would work really well. There is a little kind of subtext. Uh, again, time, money. Mm. And whether or not there's an appetite for it with the audience, I really couldn't say. Yep. Mm-hmm. People do ask me about it occasionally, but I'm not sure that everyone wants it. Mm-hmm. They would be the main things, yes. I think. Yeah. Personally, what I would like, I mean, I used to work on abridged books very commonly and mm-hmm. not everyone likes abridgments, but I think sometimes they can be good because things are often overwritten I did a lot of abridgments for ABC. You used to chuck a lot of that work for me. And I realised through that process that everything is too long. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much everything. I mean, the last three books I've done, the one I finished this morning was 12 and a half hours, the one before was 16 and a half hours, the one before was, I think, 13 hours. It's like, this book's going forever. Mm. So, like I said, not everyone likes abridgments, but I think sometimes they can be worthwhile and that sometimes mm. they might make something more accessible. Yeah. My pet hate is the dialogue tags. He said, she yeah, said, yeah, yeah. he murmured, she shouted. Because you're mm. performing it, you're doing the work of that dialogue tag. So I yes, would prefer yeah. them to go. But the reality is certainly if you've got an e-book and you want your audio book to go on Audible, 
they're very interested in the whisper sync where the th- two things sync up. So oh, they very right. much want things to be word for word. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're kind of operating within those constraints. Yeah, gotcha. I was thinking the other potential way forward in it around impacting, you know, the contractual agreements that particular companies make with publishers. Why have we only got one version of particular titles? Why can't you have a range of different people interpreting a particular book yeah. the way different theatre companies can do a, in one script? You know, there's not one definitive yeah. version of a play. Yeah. Like, there's no definitive version of a book. You can have, like, the author's narration, which some people prefer. Then you can have an interpreted narration. Or you can have, you know, a range of different interpretations. You know, for example, something like, I don't know whether it's a good example or not, but say Peter Carey's True History of the Kelly Gang, it's just rife for interpretation. Why can't half a dozen people have a go at that and audiences be able to choose. Yeah, Rupert Dagus read that. Yeah, right. But for the ABC, we had Paul English read it. So Mm -hmm. this came up firstly in my conversation recently with Stacey Gagoulis, who started talking about the reading of um, Harry Potter. And I went, Mm -hmm. oh, Stephen Fry. And he said, no, Jim Dale's reading of Harry Potter. And he thinks that Jim Dale's occurred first. And then when the movies came out was when Stephen Fry started. But there exists two versions. And I was wow. like, wow. But this came up for us at the ABC because we used to go for book rights, for abridged rights. We had to abridge books because they were broadcast in 15-minute chunks. And so you had to make that chunk meaningful <laughs> and you couldn't pick up halfway through a paragraph. So you had to abridge to shape it. And so we would go for abridged rights of a book and Belinda would go for full rights of a book. So we would do different productions and it was often very interesting to see the really different approaches to casting that we had as opposed to Belinda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm often surprised by, you know, who might be, you know, attached to a book, you know, including myself. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know whether I'm right for this at times. You know, you feel like suggesting somebody else. Mm, Casting's a whole other ballgame. Yeah, yeah. And what may seem right isn't right once you're in the studio. Mm. That can happen on anything. David. Yeah, what? It's been great. It's been lovely. Yeah. It's been so nice to be in a studio with, with, with a human being, <laughs> apart from me and my dog. Yeah, how do you manage with an Irish wolfhound when you're trying to self-record in a booth? Does he want to come in and sit on your lap? Yeah, uh, he lies outside and just goes... <sighs> <sighs> and he's got a beanbag. So then it's like getting in and out of the beanbag and off the beanbag and onto the couch. <sighs> and <laughs> I've got all these outtakes of me going... <clears throat> Angus! Shut up! (laughs) I did record someone last year whose elderly dog had just had a dental procedure and she brought him in because they were on their way home from the vet and she said, oh, he can just sit down under my feet. He'll he'll just fall asleep. And he did fall Mm -hmm. asleep and started snoring. Just said, look, I'm sorry, he's just going to have to come out. He can't stay in the booth with you. Yeah. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Anytime. You've been listening to the audiobook podcast brought to you by Square Sound. If there's something that we haven't covered in our audiobook series that you'd like to know about, send us a message at studio.squaresound.com.au. The audiobook podcast was produced by Marianne Plaza, together with Abby Holmes and Justine Sloan-Lees. With special thanks to all our guest speakers, Square Sound is an audiobook and podcast studio in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for listening.